I first started researching what would become hidden figures in 2010, which means that at this point, I have spent more than three times more time with these women and with this story than I spent in college. My father worked at the NASA Langley Research Center, where hidden figures took place in Hampton, Virginia. That's where I grew up. So to a certain extent, it's always been who I am and a part of my origin story. But now hidden figures is also what I do. Writing hidden figures turned me into a full-time writer, and I can honestly say it's the best job that I've ever had. When I first started researching the book, I didn't realize that my story was about a multitude of women mathematicians. I started with the idea of writing a book about one individual, Katherine Johnson, who worked on the trajectory equations for John Glenn's 1962 orbital spaceflight. And despite the fact that until 2016, she was unknown beyond a very small cadre of NASA people, these days her name is probably close to the top of the list in terms of mathematicians recognized by the general public. Katherine Johnson wasn't just good at math, though of course she was extremely good at math. Uh, she was absorbed by it, she was compelled by it, and she had been this way for as long as she could remember. As a child, she counted everything. She counted the steps in her family's house, the dishes at the kitchen sink, stars in the sky, anything that she could count, she would count. She was an outstanding student who skipped several grades and she used to help her older brother with his homework. Now by 14, she had graduated from high school and she was enrolled in college at historically black West Virginia State Institute. And at West Virginia State, she was mentored by another great mathematical mind, Dr. W. W. Shefflin Clater, who earned his doctorate in mathematics from the University of Pennsylvania. And he was the third black math PhD in the history of the United States. At the time, Dr. Clater was considered an up and coming scholar in the field of topology but racial segregations prevented him from taking a position at his alma mater or any of the United States major research universities. Instead, from West Virginia State, Clater played a behind the scenes role in this history. And I like to think of him as the ghost of NASA future. Despite the fact that the chances were virtually zero of any woman, much less a black woman, finding a math job other than teaching, he believed his star student would eventually find a position that matched her significant talent, and he began training her as a research mathematician. Where will I find a job? Katherine Johnson asked them. I'm gonna get you ready, Dr. Clater told her, but finding the job, that's going to be your problem. So then after graduation from college, Catherine taught in all black public schools in the state of Virginia and also in West Virginia. She did some graduate study and then she spent several years raising a family. It took her 16 years to find the job that Dr. Clater had prepared her for, but when she was hired by the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, the Langley Laboratory and the NACA as it was called is the predecessor agency to NASA, she was able to hit the ground running. Over the years, people had begun to think that she was the first or the only black woman of her era to have worked at NASA, or even the first or the only woman from that era to work at NASA. And I can tell you from my very first interview with her, Mrs. Johnson was not interested in being put on a pedestal by herself. Even as she talked to me about her own contributions to the space program, she was very clear about the fact that nothing as complex and as high stakes as sending someone into orbit gets done without the talent, the hard work, and the commitment of tens of thousands of people. She also wanted me to know that not only was she not the first black woman on the job, but when she showed up at Langley in 1953, she was welcomed by an entire room full of black female mathematicians. She told me unequivocally that Dorothy Vaughn, the woman who ran the segregated West Area Computing Group, was brilliant. She said she was the smartest person that she had ever met. And if someone like Katherine Johnson tells you that someone is the smartest person that she's ever met, you take notes and you remember those notes. Now, Katherine Johnson showed me by pointing, her, pointing me to Dorothy Vaughn and to the others, those other women, she showed me not just the beginning of my story, but the meaning of my story. The first five black women started working at the Langley Laboratory in 1943, and I believe that when we count all 10 of the NASA centers from 1943 through 1980, there may have been as many as 80 black women working as computers, mathematicians, engineers, and scientists. And what's just as remarkable is that they were part of a larger cohort of female mathematicians from all backgrounds, 
that starting in 1935 grew to be several hundred strong, perhaps more than a thousand women all told. A thousand women working as professional mathematicians in the beginning and the, mid the middle of the 20th century, getting up and going to work at NASA every day for decades, and history looked right past them. Realizing that female mathematicians played a critical role in NASA's golden age helped me to make the connection between those hidden figures and other female pioneers in science, technology, and computing, like Annie Jump Cannon and the female astronomers who did the fundamental work of classifying stars working at the Harvard Astronomical, Lab Astronomical Laboratory in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Davis Sobel tells their story in her excellent book, The Glass Universe, which I highly recommend. Natalia Holt writes about the women of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in her book, Rise of the Rocket Girls. And many of you are probably familiar with the name Grace Hopper, who became a computer programmer while serving in the United States Navy during World War II. Now, I had a real aha moment after reading John Gertner's book, The Idea Factory, which tells the history of Bell Labs, which was AT&T's research and development engine. I had spent much of the 1990s and 2000s working in digital media, but I have to admit that until I read that book, The Idea Factory, I really didn't know much about the history of the telecommunications industry. The Idea Factory's jacket copy describes the book as a deeply human story about the extraordinary men who laid the foundation for the information age, and indeed it is a drama starring many of the industry's founding fathers, like Claude Shannon, who pioneered the theory behind communications networks, and William Shockley, who won a Nobel Prize for research that led to the development of the semiconductor, and then, as you may know, became infamous as one of America's best known and most unapologetic eugenicists. But it is a fascinating account of how communications technology evolved from telegraphs to smartphones, and reading it, I felt that same sense of wonder as when I was researching how human flight evolved from the Wright brothers' rudimentary airplane to the Apollo spacecraft. And then eventually, I came to this paragraph describing the Bell Labs math department in the late 1930s and early 1940s, right on the cusp of World War II. And there was this parenthetical reference mentioning the fact that by this time, the company employed a number of female mathematicians. This was in 1940s, early, late, late uh, 40s and 30s. So this wasn't even a full line of text, but this seemingly throwaway reference commanded my full attention. I felt like the past had given me a secret sign. Here was a research and development organization similar in ambition and scope to the National Advisory Committee for uh, Aeronautics, and it was operating at the same time. As with aeronautics, the telecommunications industry was doing a huge amount of experimentation, data collection, and analysis in order to improve a technology that was connecting the world in ways that were previously only thought of and possible in science fiction. And female mathematicians were a part of that effort. I have come to believe that one of the great underreported stories of the 20th century, and this is a century in which we taught machines to count, we split the atom, and we escaped the bonds of gravity of our planet, is that of women sitting in rooms doing math. Now, whenever I see scientific progress that requires data collection, data reduction, and data analysis, I start looking for the women. Which begs the question, and this is the one that I receive more than any other when talking about hidden figures, why haven't we heard this story before? These women's lives intersected many of the signature moments of the 20th century, so why has it taken us decades to celebrate the contributions of Katherine Johnson, Dorothy Vaughn, Mary Jackson, Christine Darden, and all of the other women who worked like them as mathematicians? Why didn't we turn them into professional role models and use them to pull generations of young people, particularly young women, into science and math careers? Well, we first have to acknowledge that the raw numbers of people that we're talking about are not huge. In 1940, just 2% of black American women earned college degrees, and no black women were counted in the 1940 census as working as engineers. This was a time when only 10% of white women in the United States earned college degrees, and not even a third of white men had college degrees. And I bet the, can the statistics are very similar here in Canada. These women were a minority of a minority of a minority. 
Certainly part of the reason is also that during World War II and the Cold War, NASA, like many other defense organizations, classified much of its research. These were the days of loose lips sink ships. Every building of the Langley Laboratory during World War II was painted black to camouflage the buildings from aerial attack, and Langley's engineer in charge distributed memos to everyone working there, warning employees to stay on the lookout for German spies who might be hanging around the laboratory disguised as soldiers from the Army Air Corps base next door. The most blatant reason for their invisibility was the physical separation of the workplace itself. The black women were less visible because they worked in a segregated office apart from the white women. And then they were forced to use colored bathrooms. They sat at the colored table in the lunchroom. Um, but more broadly, women of all backgrounds were separated from the men. In the beginning, the black women went to West Computing. The white women went into the East Area Computing Office. And all of the women had a really difficult time breaking out of the computing pools and getting the plum assignments as members of an engineering team. And that leads to the biggest reason why I believe we've not acknowledged these women before. For decades, computing was considered women's work. The men were the engineers and the women were the mathematicians. The men did the manly analytical work and the women did the rote computing. At least that's the way it was perceived at that time. Most of these women, regardless of their race, were hired in as sub-professionals. And that put them above, above the clerical employees in the organization's hierarchy, but a rung below the men who were generally hired in as engineers. And that also includes the black men uh, that NASA began bringing in as engineers in the 1950s. The women often went on to do the same work as the men, but even when that was the case, the sub-professional grade meant that they could be paid less. Growing up in Hampton, Virginia, I had the good fortune to see black or female mathematicians, scientists, or engineers as normal people. They were as normal as the teachers or the bus drivers, the lawyers, the construction workers, the military people who lived in our community. There was no cognitive dissonance for me when I heard the words black, female, and scientist and realized that they were describing one single person. And yet, even I have to admit that it took the better part of my adult life to see them as they deserve to be seen, to ask questions about their careers, to value their contributions to the community and to our society at large. I was living next door and for years they existed in my blind spot as well. Mm -hmm.